Last week, I started a series on uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now, abide these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Faith is easy to preach on. I've preached on faith so many times, so many, many times. Love, there never should be a sermon that I ever preach that is not based upon love. But hope is the forgotten one of the three. It's one that we really don't have a very good understanding of it. Um, when we think of hope, a lot of times we hear the, well, I think so, maybe so, hope so. And it really is not what Christ is defining in the Word of God. It is all through the Word of God. Fifteen times in the book of Job, you hear the word hope. Job, he had a tough life. But it was always about the hope. The Psalms that praise God, always 25 times they said, our hope is in God. In the Proverbs, the book of wisdom, eight times you hear it, hope was there. 21 times in the prophets, hope is there. It means to anticipate with great expectation and confidence. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, blessed is the man whose trust in the Lord, whose hope, get this now, is the Lord. Christ is our hope. Lamentations 3.26 says, It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Romans 4.18 says, Contrary to hope, in hope believed. That was Abraham. There's a difference in the attitude, in the countenance, where the peace and the joy of God reigns and prevails within us. That's hope. We're going to look today at the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Peter was a man who made mistakes, but he was a man that God had great use for, wanted to bless, wanted to anoint, wanted to use in a mighty way. He was one who stood and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, you are Peter. And on your this faith, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He was a, one who, who denied that he ever knew Christ. The night Jesus was taken to be crucified. And yet he was the one who ran to the tomb passed his brother and ran into, or passed John and ran into the tomb, who preached the first sermon at Pentecost. He knew what it was to believe in faith. He knew the love of God. But there was something that changed Peter that you see <clears throat> forefront at the beginning of this epistle. It was hope. So if you would, if you'd stand with us in honor of reading God's Word as we look at 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively or a living hope through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, incorrupt, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice. We could say it today in first person. In this, we greatly rejoice. Amen? Amen. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved. We have been grieved by various trials, the things that we walk through in life. That the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, can I put there? Yet. Having not seen, love. Though now you do not see Him, yet believing, you rejoice 
with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Let's pray. Lord, teach us about your hope. Jesus, you are our hope. Give us a, a refreshing course of what it means to hope in you, to live in you, to trust in you, to have confidence in you, an expectation of an, a great work. Father, we need to live this way. Teach us what that means. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. He says in the end of verse 2, grace to you and let the peace be multiplied. I, I want to have peace in my heart and I want you to have peace in your heart too. I know what I've been through and I know what y'all have gone through as well. It's never easy, but God says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He is our peace. And because of that, we are blessed. This is the same word that in Matthew 5 is the word translated happy, prosperous. Literally, as God puts His hand upon you to anoint you, to encourage you. That's what it literally means for us. We are blessed because we have the God and Father who is with us. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who came to live for us and to die for us who about Jesus, it says, according to His abundant mercy. That a mercy is we don't receive what we deserve. We don't, we don't get the punishment of our sins. We get much more. He gives us what His desire for us, not what our works yield to us. So He says here plainly, He said, Christ came because of His abundant mercy. He has begotten us again. Like He told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. We have been born again to a living hope. The word again there in the Greek New Testament is translated one of two ways depending on the context of the passage. One literally means again, to do again. The other means from above. Now that changes it just a little bit. We have been begotten again from above by our Lord Jesus Christ, who is this hope that is alive. Here we see the adjective has the participle, which literally means the adjective describes the verb there. It describes the word there, or it doesn't describe the, the, the verb, it describes the noun, hope. But the way that it is done, it is a living hope. It is alive within us. It doesn't diminish. It is there to, to, to blow the flames of the hope in our life. Sometimes our hope needs to be encouraged. Sometimes our faith, though it stands upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ, amen? We know that we stand upon not who we are, but who He is. But sometimes the circumstances of life make it diminish just a little bit. And maybe even to the place where we get so, well, I, I think so. Maybe so. I hope so. Oh man, that's, that's not strong life, is it? That can really lead you down a dirt road of, of hurt and pain. You need to know in whom you stand. And he says that is Christ Jesus. Peter, when he's saying this, something changed in my life. I, I was a man who had been changed. You know, we live in sin, chasing after happiness, doing what we want, being confident that we can choose our way, which we hope would be the right way. But, but when we come to Christ, by the way, our way is never a fun way. You might like how it feels, but you don't like how it makes you feel later. Despondency, despair, troubles and trials. But we have the living hope. We've been re Our sins have been blotted out. They've been washed clean. You at your best wasn't enough, so Christ took you there and raised you up to His best. 
Not your best, his best. Not your sin, but his sanctification. Not your choice, but his love, his grace that just pours out. All the things that God knows are good and right and best for us, that's what he wants for us. He wants you to have that. You can trust him. You don't have to have a wavering doubt and fear. Because we, it all changed. The, the script flipped when Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary. When it looked like it was over when they put him in the tomb. But on Resurrection Sunday, he came back to give life and give it abundantly. And when we accepted him into our heart, that living hope that was in him is in us. A confident assurance, an expectation that something great is going to happen here. We have it to, he says, we have been saved to a living hope. In verse 4, to an inheritance. Now that's not the works of my life, that's the inheritance. Somebody has to die for you to receive the inheritance. And Jesus died. But he's back alive again to make sure that you receive the inheritance. I want you to have it's what he says. I don't know that any of us fully understand this, but you, let's say it anyway. God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Is that hard to fathom? How many of y'all know that to be true though? And he wants to bless you like he blessed Jesus. He wants to be there for you like, it, like the Father is for the Son, and the Son is in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in the Father. All one. Satan wants to divide and conquer. Satan wants to attack relationships. He wants to tear apart. But God says, no, I've given you so much more. We have an inheritance that is incorruptible. Everything in this world will rot and fade away. The best day is followed by the worst night. The greatest win is forgotten and loses its meaning. Everything of this world is temporary. We're just pilgrims passing through. But the inheritance that He has given us cannot be tainted by our own sins. It is incorruptible. It is undefiled. It does not fade away. I love this fact here because this word kept means it implies, the participle means it implies action that is constantly going on. When it is kept by God, He is constantly keeping me. Like Petra said when, when she was describing the song of He Will Hold Me Fast like a parent will hold a child's hand to protect it from the, the dangers of life, to hold on to it so, so that child will always be protected. God says, I will always, perpetually, continuously keep you. I'll keep the inheritance. I'll keep it incorrupt. I will keep it undefiled. And it is reserved. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're on the title deed of heaven. You belong to Him, and He belongs to you. I've seen so much death lately. It's affected me, folks. I'll just be honest with you. It's affected me. The last three or four months of it, it's just, it's just hard to continue to say goodbye again and again and again. Last Sunday night, I, I went to see my, my young 32-year-old friend that, that I coached and, 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 and to see his body, it was like hugging a skeleton. And, and his arms were about the arms size of my, my granddaughter's arms. And, and, but, but the smile that was on his face. And I said, Thomas, what can I do for you? Just pray. It is what it is. I'm good. He thanked me. He thanked me. I'm there to encourage Him. And He's encouraging me because Christ is encouraging Him. He's not on the down and out. He's up on the up and away. He's just closer to heaven than I am. I mean, I could leave today. 
But I'm living that whether I leave today or it's 20 or 30 more years, that, that I will never lose track of God's work in my life. That I can bring glory and honor and praise unto Him. Though in the meantime... Verse 6 says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while. I, I, I wonder what he means when, sometimes when he says a little while. It, it doesn't seem like a little while. Sometimes it seems like a permanent address. We have been, uh, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, all different kinds of hurts. Life's tough. Anybody testify to that? It's tough to see loved ones hurt. It's tough to go through hard times. Has anybody ever gotten discouraged? Anybody ever worried? Anybody ever wondered if you make it? Anybody ever thought things could be or should be different? I mean, I can raise both hands. But the difference is, at the end of the day, I know that I've got somebody there for me. I'm held by Him. I'm kept by Him. And this is the thing about it. God only does that which is best. So if you're going through a trial or hardship or tribulation or, or distress, though you may not like it, it's best. Though you can't see any good in it, He can. So, it doesn't happen to you until it comes through His precious hands first. There are times I know Satan wants to bring so much heartache to our lives, but God says, you're not doing that. But there are other times God will say, yeah, I'll allow that because it will make it better. When steel is made, it is taken and it is put into a temperature, and the temperature is raised up at a certain rate to a certain degree. It's called anelling. And, and then it is lowered down in temperature once again at a certain rate, and it's held at that temperature for a while. Where the impurities get out, hold on, I'm going to use their words, until the stress is taken out. Wow. Wow. God will allow you to walk through the fire, but He's already set the temperature to remove the impurities, and He'll bring it back down once again at the rate that He so determines. And when you get there, the stress will be taken out, and you'll be stronger than you ever would have been before. Y'all like that? That's something you can hold to. The anchor holds, doesn't it? You know, my trust is not in me. My trust is in the anchor. I just hold on. Right? My trust is not in me. It's in Christ. And I'll hold on to Him. I love Petra's example of the child and holding on to the parent's hand. When any of y'all were kids or when you were the parent, did your kids try to pull away? And when they tried to pull away, did you let them? I mean, they're just yanking. I know my mama had a grip. And my mama had an ability to hold me with one hand and spank me with the other. Y'all ever been there? And I, that's how I learned to dance. It was like this, you know, when, when she was... Dad was more tempered. Mom would hit you with whatever was close. Her hand was always close. You know, sometimes God will do what is best for us, though we do not like it, but His hand that is love will hold on. He will keep us. He will hold us. I like this, that the genuineness of your faith the trial of the putting him put to the test, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The things that we go through, as long as we keep our hope in Him, will bring Him praise, glory, and honor. Whom, though we have not yet seen, we still love Him. Don't you? Don't you? Though now you do not see Him, yet believing, you rejoice. Don't you like to rejoice? And I love the way this Peter who when he denied Jesus, the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. But when Christ said, go tell my disciples and Peter, when he met him for breakfast that day and, and they, they ate breakfast together and he said, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love me. Feed my sheep. I still have a plan for you. You're still useful for kingdom's work. Don't lose hope, Peter. Three times, three times he said, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He says here in verse 8, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Church, listen. I wish we could get to the place where we did not control our joy. I wish we could get to the place that we were so in love we didn't care what anybody else thought, what anybody else would say. We're just so in love that we can't help it. Y'all know what I mean when I, you have a case of the can't help it. It's important. How many of y'all know I love my wife? I've said it from the pulpit enough, hadn't I? By the way, I tell her every day I love her. I do. She's God's gift for me. I don't know why. I got the best end of the deal, no doubt. That's right. I'll agree that. But just to understand this, I try to let her know that I love her. And sometimes words, it's hard to share your heart in words. But church, it's an honor to know Him. It's an honor to be saved by Him. To be kept by Him. That He's gone to prepare a place so that heaven would be heaven for me. He's gone to prepare a place for me that I'm not forgotten. I will never be forgotten in heaven and I won't be forgotten on earth. He's got so much planned for me. And I think every now and again, we need to get out of our earth's shoes and we need to sl slide on our heaven's slippers and, 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 and not worry about anything else. I understand that when David praised God in front of the people, people criticized him. I guarantee you Jesus didn't. And though our love is there, it should be love that is not ashamed. When we do, it will bring praise, glory, and honor unto Him. The old preachers used to talk about having a fit. They get up preaching and they get to stomping. Any of y'all ever see those preachers? They stomped in Jesus' name. I'm not a stomper. And... and Folks, I don't rarely, I, I rarely cry. But if I do, it's usually in the pulpit when my heart gets so squeezed by him. But Brother Mark, I, I probably need to apologize for you because when you lead us in worship, we're supposed to join you there and we're supposed to get all the other stuff out of the way. Because we have a hope, folks. He is my hope. He is my hope. Let the Lord encourage your heart today. It would be wonderful and great, and I believe it would be God-honoring if we could just clear off a space and have a holy fit for Jesus. I'm not talking about getting out of control. I'm not talking about putting on. 
That's fake. Amen? But just to express your love. 